Welcome to the Sustainable Phosphorus webinar series. I'm your host today, Matt Schultz with the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. And the theme of today's webinar is managing your pee on the farm. Uh, you don't want to pee everywhere, and so we're going to help you with that. And that's just uh, one of the things we do at the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. Um, I want to give a little shout out to our members and our partners who have supported our work all along. Our organization is a members organization that serves as North America's central forum and advocate for the sustainable use, recovery, and recycling of phosphorus in the food system. Uh, believe it or not, I get paid a salary to do this and uh, and run some of our other activities. And a lot of the folks you see on the on the right here have put up the funds to help support that. So if you, you would like to join us, uh, we'd love to have you as members. And you can reach us through our website at phosphorusalliance.org to find out more about that. One other announcement before we get started. Uh, we have a big event happening on September 30th and October 1st. This is our Phosphorus Forum. This year is Phosphorus Forum 2020, of course. And we usually do this event live. Uh, we were originally planning on this for Washington, D.C. this year, but uh, things, events happened as they did. And so we had to turn to a virtual format, which is great. Um, but we wanted to break this over two days. So we're doing it September 30th and October 1st so people don't die on Zoom. Um, and we've got a great slate of speakers over those two days. Um, we have keynotes from Dr. Don Besh from the University of Maryland, Center for Environmental Science, from the, uh, also from the CEO of OCP North America, Carrie McNamara. And uh, there's some great topics being addressed, as you can see on the right. Uh, two that might be interesting to this group in particular are uh, a talk on pay for, pay for performance nutrient um, pollution mitigation and phosphorus transport modeling in agricultural context. Uh, the event's free. We're asking for a donation, um, but you can register at our website, which is phosphorusalliance.org slash phosphorus hyphen forum, or you could just go to phosphorusalliance.org and uh, click on our activities pad, uh, a tab to find the event. So with that, we can get started with the actual uh, presentations. We have a really great team of speakers. And sometimes when we do these webinars, I don't know all the speakers uh, beforehand, but I'm uh, uh, privileged to know all these fine folks that are speaking to us today. And I'll read bios of each one of them uh, before their talks. But first, I just want to kind of set up the presentations for today. So. The theme, of course, is managing your pee on the farm, and we can't live without phosphorus, as many of you know. Um, we get ours through our diet um, of crops and animals that feed on those crops, and those crops, of course, must be fertilized with phosphorus if they're going to grow and yield well. Um, if the crops don't yield, that leads to adverse economic consequences for sure, but adverse environmental ones as well, um, in that more acres are needed to produce the same amount of food, and that means more resources expended, more pollutants generated, and more biodiversity impacts. So on the other hand, uh, if fields are fertilized with pea at above agronomic rates, they tend to shed their phosphorus, which ends up in local waterways often. Uh, this causes toxic algal blooms sometimes, it causes hypoxia, and it drives up greenhouse gas emissions as the aquatic microbes that live in those water bodies proliferate, die, and decompose, uh, producing greenhouse gases in the process. So uh, what practices do we have at our disposal to fertilize appropriately? And how do we mitigate losses of phosphorus after application? That's today's topic of discussion. And starting us out today is Krista Maruka. And I'm going to read a bit of bio uh, about you, Krista, as you get started with your presentation. Um, and also, I'll stop sharing my screen so you can start sharing, Krista. So Krista is the Senior Program Officer at OCP North America, where she oversees sustainability. And she has a mission to advance the smart and efficient use of phosphorus on the farm through innovation, research, and supply chain initiatives. Krista's background is in community outreach and rural development. Uh, both in the U.S. and Africa, and she joined OCP four years ago after serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco, which I think is very cool, Krista, and thanks for joining us for uh, the webinar today. And thanks for inviting me to join you today on this exciting discussion. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with what really is an esteemed group of panelists, so thank you very much for the invitation. 
Um, and I was asked to uh, talk a little bit today about uh, the private sector's role in advancing sustainability on the farm. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope that today in my short remarks, I can familiarize folks a little bit with OCP and how we in the industry have responded to some of those natural resource concerns that stem from phosphorus management um, that Matt had mentioned. <clears throat> and I know a couple folks are also um, joining from the research and academic um, fields. And so, you know, perhaps by sharing a little bit about the uh, business interest uh, and the and private sector involvement that could be helpful in some future funding proposals for working together um, across the public and private sector to achieving a more sustainable phosphorus use on the farm. So um, a little bit about OCP. If you haven't heard of us, that's all right. But we are the number one exporter worldwide of phosphate rock and phosphate derivative products. So that includes phosphoric acid and uh, fertilizer products uh, like DAP and MAP, um, your TSP and blended NPK products. Um, we're headquartered in Morocco, where we have the world's largest reserves of phosphorus. So we're engaged really across the entire value chain um, for phosphorus from the mining and extraction to that processing um, into chemical fertilizers, the storage distribution and transport um, of those fertilizers. And then um, globally, we have a host of sustainable agriculture programs um, that seek to ensure the sustainable uh, use of our products on the farm. Um, we have a truly global footprint um, with um, pretty significant market share on, on each continent. Um, I have a, a map there showing our export volume. Um, globally. I think what stands out to folks on this map is that we um, have a pretty large presence in Africa. Um, we've made significant contributions to the continent um, and not just in uh, growing our, our number there, <laughs> um, but really in expanding the pie, um, stimulating demand for phosphorus in areas where there's been a history of lack of access that's resulted in degraded soils and nutrient mining. Um, I encourage anyone who wants to learn more about OCP and our approach to sustainability to take a look at our annual report, which is GRI certified, and this year's just came out uh, in June. Um, I can talk all day about our approach, but I think um, taking a look at the numbers is where you really start to understand the impact that this can have. Um, we talk about uh, our sustainability approach, uh, first of all, when it comes to the production of phosphorus fertilizers, and this really is at the heart of our sustainability strategy. Um, part of that is because it's, you know, it's within our own four walls, so we can have really a lot of uh, impact um, in improving the sustainable um, manufacturing of fertilizer products. Um, but it also ensures that farmers can trust that the products that they're applying on a farm have a limited, um, you know, environmental footprint in the production process and help them achieve their own sustainability goals. Um, so we've made significant commitments uh, to achieve 100% renewable energy use, um, powering our production and mining facilities by 2030, and we're well on our way there, um, as well as reducing the use of groundwater sources in the production process. We also have a number of initiatives um, along the supply chain in working directly with farmers, and we have a lot of experience uh, doing soil mapping at sort of a macro scale across Africa to ensure that we provide customized fertilizers um, for African soils, um, and then work directly with farmers doing uh, soil testing and analysis and working with them to interpret the results of those tests um, and implement management changes. So I sometimes get some puzzled looks uh, when I talk about sustainability as a big um, agribusiness company. Um, so I wanted to first of all share a little bit about sort of what are the driving factors um, at, a, at a high, high scale um, for uh, the private sector to get involved in this topic. And that I think really starts at the global level with the development of the sustainable development goals and commitments to climate action that we've made globally. And those have really translated to um, getting more engaged in addressing local natural resource concerns that stem from that. So if you're not familiar, uh, the sustainable development goals um, are a, a broad set of goals that we've aimed to achieve by 2030. Um, and uh, there are 17 goals. I would say that agriculture is usually sort of pigeonholed into uh, SDG two of achieving zero hunger. Um, and certainly uh, the, the whole uh, goal of, of producing food is to um, you know, achieve reduced hunger and provide nutritious, nutritious and adequate uh, calories for people around the world. 
But I think there's been a broader recognition that agriculture has a role to play much more broadly um, than that. That agriculture has a major impact um, even on uh, social justice issues as it's a lot of smallholder farmers around the world are dependent on subsistence farming for their traditional livelihoods. And um, there are plenty of uh, labor issues um, that are tied to agriculture um, that can uh, be tied to the sustainable development goals. And then certainly, um, from an environmental perspective, we've seen that there's more and more knowledge that's gained around the role of agriculture in climate change mitigation um, and sequestering carbon potentially in soils um, and improving climate resilience and adaptation to a changing climate in developing countries. Um, nature and biodiversity is also certainly impacted by farming systems as we uh, change the landscape to grow more food. And so really understanding sort of the, the much broader impact that uh, the food system has on achieving these sustainable development goals has resulted in more pressure um, to make greater commitments to really contribute more um, to the global effort. And I have to say, it's really not just about risk management. Um, it's, it goes much beyond sort of maintaining that social license to operate. I think that leading brands um, have come to see like the value um, in integrating sustainability into their core corporate business strategy. Um, and that's led to some really interesting initiatives uh, when you look on the ground in addressing those local natural resource concerns, um, particularly when you start looking at the fertilizer sector. I mean, fertilizer management we know is just one component of a, a complex system-wide change that needs to happen um, to improve environmental outcomes in, the, in agriculture. Um, but we really wanna drive home that fertilizer decisions are, are a really important piece of that puzzle, um, particularly when you're talking about managing water quality, um, soil health and soil quality and uh, the contributions to climate change. And then I would say that as Matt mentioned, you know, sustainable intensification can also uh, have an impact in uh, ecosystem conservation when it's managed appropriately, of course. Um, and phosphorus, uh, more specifically, is certainly tied uh, to some of those concerns here in the US around water quality um, and its contributions to soil health. So what's the industry's response been to this acknowledgement of those local natural resource concerns? Um, I would say that the, there's been a lot of coalition around 4R principles, um, which another panelist, Tidy, is going to um, speak a little bit more in detail about. But just generally, the 4Rs really are a set of guiding principles or a framework that farmers can use when working with their certified crop advisors to uh, identify the right management plan for phosphorus that works in their farm and in their fields, um, using the right source, right rate, right time, and right place for fertilizer applications. And I would just say that whenever we're talking about the four hours, we really wanna optimize the impact that we have in that education and outreach, both for the farmers and getting that uh, return on investment and when it comes to the impact on nature, um, by talking about the systems approach that's needed um, in fertilizer management and talk about the conservation piece as well. Um, there are a number of conservation practices like cover crops or uh, conservation tillage that we know has a really important impact uh, in those practice changes on water quality and on soil health um, as well. And so thinking about the four R's and conservation together really maximizes that impact. Um, there are a number of different practices that you would consider sort of part of the 4R and conservation framework. I listed a few here. I would say one of the pieces that's missing, I just made a note of at the bottom, is you really don't see a lot of edge of field practices listed um, in this response. And maybe that's a, a gap. Um, we know that there's a lot of impact that edge of field monitoring and practices can, can have. I think, um, at this point, they're often seen as sort of an added cost um, and not necessarily tied to production. And maybe that's a misconception, um, but certainly uh, uh, it is not typically included um, in this list of practices. I'd also be remiss if we didn't talk about really briefly the role of innovation um, in managing phosphorus on the farm, um, because there's been really a significant underinvestment in uh, fertilizer technologies, especially when you start to look at uh, the amount of money that has been invested from the seed and the chemical sector in comparison, um, it's really been under-resourced. This is something that OCP recognizes and has increased its uh, R&D spending 40-fold 
um, to try to address it, um, both through uh, public sector research collaborations. Um, most of those are done through Mohammed VI Polytechnic University and its network of uh, partnership universities around the world. Um, and that really allows us to tap into a network of experts um, in the public sector and advancing public knowledge. Um, but there's also a strong corporate interest at OCP and I think among the fertilizer industry in supporting research around uh, sustainable phosphorus, um, primarily um, pr uh, phosphorus use efficiency. So, you know, we know that a significant amount of phosphorus that is applied in the field is lost and not uh, used by the plant for increased productivity and growth. Um, and that's a problem. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to innovate and find the next big disruptive innovation that would allow for um, more efficient use of nutrients. Um, we also are really interested in learning more about field to watershed flows and understanding how that phosphorus is lost and may be um, recaptured. I think the, the area of nutrient recovery and recycling is really interesting, especially from a private sector lens. Um, you know, we're really involved in um, identifying technologies that can recapture phosphorus at a large scale, like at wastewater treatment facilities. Um, but, you know, it's, it would be really interesting to learn more about ways we can recover and recycle phosphorus, even on the farm scale, um, and really put that back into um, the cycle and close the loop as we move towards a more circular economy. Um, and then we're also looking at uh, research into the four R's, local best management practices that can be applied um, sort of on a more hyper-local level and the role of technology and precision agriculture um, in helping to achieve those. And then of course, phosphorus and soil health, as we're learning more about the potential of soils to increase uh, carbon sequestration potential, um, what is the role of phosphorus and how can we uh, greater, more greatly contribute to that effort? So I'm gonna close there. I just hope that um, <clears throat> one of the messages that comes out of this short talk is that we are all working towards the same goal and farmers really need system-wide support to make those transitions to more sustainable nutrient management practices. Um, you know, farmers themselves, they don't wanna be spending money on nutrients that they don't have to. Um, and they generally want to be good stewards of the land um, for the next generation and for their rural communities. And then business. And um, we're, you know, sort of in this race towards finding the next big disruptive innovation um, and, and finding more nutrient use efficient uh, technologies, even looking outside the box at more microbial and biological solutions that ultimately would help provide farmers with more options to achieving their sustainability goals. Um, one piece of the supply chain that I, I really didn't touch on, but is really, really important um, <clears throat> would be the role of the retailer. Uh, making sure that interests are aligned so that they're seeing the value of not just change in products um, that they're selling, but also the value of practice adoption um, through their product sales. Um, one potential way to do that is through uh, the 4R certification program that's been growing in a number of states. Um, but I think there's still some work to be done there um, in making sure that they're part of the conversation as well. And then uh, further along the supply chain, of course, food companies and consumers are all calling for more sustainably grown food. Um, so there really can be a value in partnering across the supply chain, both with public and private sector partners. Um, certainly there's still work to be done in aligning those incentives and in finding market-based solutions. Um, I briefly mentioned edge of field as one area where there's an opportunity to do that. Um, but I think, you know, this is, ultimately a, a positive story. There's been a, really an expansion of, of initiatives uh, like the Fo Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance where we can come together and talk about shared interests and efforts that we can do to work together to, to make real change. So I'll, uh, I'll pause there and turn it over to other panelists. And thanks again, Matt, for uh, inviting me to talk a little bit today. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, uh, Krista. And uh, I should say OCP has been a great partner of the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance all these years, and we really appreciate that support. Um, I'm going to, I hope you're seeing my screen now. What I'm going to do is use this sort of PowerPoint format to uh, paste your questions into the screen so everyone can see what the questions are. And then, um, uh, Krista, if you could stay on from it, I think there's just two questions here for you to answer, uh, if you would. So the first question uh, that came in is, how is the percentage of future CO2 reduction split between production, renewable energy, and transport clean fuels? Do you have an answer for that one? 
You know, I'm not sure about um, the exact percentage, like the contribution that uh, production plays in the amount of uh, emissions that's embedded into a product um, as opposed to transport. Um, I will say that there is uh, a significant amount of CO2 that's produced in transport during the production process. Um, so getting phosphate, which uh, is in rock form from the mine down to the production site is an area where uh, having using um, clean sources to do that has significantly reduced um, our CO2 footprint. We've um, actually made the world's first phosphorus slurry pipeline uh, to <laughs> cut down our emissions and water use uh, in that process. And then of course, when you're thinking about transport, the next step is from getting it from uh, the production site to the farm. And that can be done um, through barge. It's usually shipped around the world and then up the Mississippi. Uh, and so that certainly has a role to play as well. Okay, great. Thanks uh, for that answer. And just one more question. Does OCP North America collaborate with U.S. universities for R&D? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so we have um, been working closely with, uh, as I mentioned, UM6P, University of Mohammed VI Polytechnique. Just call it UM6P for short. Too long. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're based in Morocco, um, but they have been able to establish joint partnerships with U.S. universities um, that's been a really great resource for OCP as well um, in being able to work with um, really world-renowned experts uh, in those topic areas that I showed, um, including in the US. Um, and then we do support uh, research directly um, with US universities and uh, we recently have supported a USDA project. Um, so, you know, absolutely, we're always looking for, um, for, for working together with folks here in the States. Great. Thanks again, Krista. Uh, that was a great presentation and uh, look forward to continued work together as things move along. So our, our next uh, speaker that's coming up, I'm going to uh, first, um, well, actually, Heidi, if you want to take over, I'll stop sharing my screen and you can share yours. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Heidi Peterson, and she leads the Sand County Foundation's Agricultural Conservation Team and sets a strategic strategic direction in research and farmer engagement. Heidi previously served as the Phosphorus Program Director with the International Plant Nutrition Institute, and prior to that at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, where she administered the state's clean water research program to quantify the nutrient reduction benefits of agricultural conservation practices to address impaired waters. Her PhD was from the University of Minnesota in agricultural engineering, and her MS was from Purdue in uh, agronomy. And thanks again, Heidi, for joining us today to talk to us about uh, nutrient management. Well, it's such a, pl a pleasure to be part of this webinar uh, today. And so thanks for having me. I'm going to be talking about nutrient management planning, or more specifically, the four, R, four R's of phosphorus management. So some of you know me from my time with IPNI and and might be unfamiliar with Sand County Foundation. The Sand County Foundation is named after Aldo Leopold, who's shown on the screen. We're a nonprofit conservation organization that inspires and enables private landowners to ethically manage the nat natural resources in their care. And we focus on, on private landowners because 60% of the land in the United States is privately owned with 70% of that in agricultural use. So we believe private landowners hold the key to environmental improvement. Global population, or in the next 30 years, the global population is expected to increase by 2 billion people. And so depending on how you set your consumption product, product projections. To meet the growing demand for food, fiber, and feed, the world's population needs to increase between 25 to 70 percent by 2050. However, U.S. farmland has decreased 5 percent since 2000, and that's equivalent to more than 45 million acres. But even with those fewer acres, the U.S. ag system has become more efficient to increase productivity in order to meet this demand. And by looking at this graphic, which is depicting total factor productivity, you can see the total farm inputs has remained relatively stable as the outputs has increased. So even though our agricultural system has become more efficient due to advances in ag mechanization and 
fertilizer use, our water quality continues to be degraded. In fact, 46% of US rivers and stream miles are in poor biological condition. Nitrogen and phosphorus are the most widespread chemical stressors. Ag inputs are the largest phosphorus sources to the Mississippi Atchafalaya River Basin with 49% of those from fertilizer and manure. But that being said, it's important to point out that this region does produce over 40% of the corn grow, grown in the world. So it is dominated by ag production. For some of you, this is gonna be a review, but um, we know that there are um, some folks coming new into the phosphorus world um, on the presentation today. So just a few things to point out that the use of phosphorus fertilizers is critical for meeting our growing food supply. Phosphorus is the key to life. It's a component of every living plant and animal cell and a vital element for metabolic processes. In plants, phosphorus improves a flower formation and seed production. It increases stalk and stem strength and stimulates root development. In addition to aiding plant growth and development, phosphorus fertilization can increase flavonoids and other antioxidants in fruits and vegetables. It improves water use and speeds up plant maturity. Phosphorus is taken up by crops primarily as orthophosphate. The major phosphorus fertilizers are highly sol soluble. Once it's dissolved, the phosphorus and orthophosphate fertilizers, such as MAP and DAP, is available for plant uptake. However, phosphorus chemistry in soils is very complex. And so, for example, if we just look at, at, um, at the pH, for example, of the soil, it doesn't affect phosphorus availability directly, but it does indicate how certain minerals like iron, aluminum, and calcium interact with phosphorus in the soil. And so if we look at, for example, in an acidic soil or pH less than five, iron and aluminum concentrations are, re, are high, resulting in high phosphorus fixation. And the same is true in alkaline soils because soluble calcium is abundant. Phosphorus in, a soil, in the soil is a good thing for plants. However, too much of a good thing can be bad. Eutrophication is the natural aging of lakes or streams by nutrient enrichment. And although it is natural, increasing the additions of nutrients can accelerate this process in the same way that nitrogen and phosphorus fertilize crops, they can also fertilize the plants in the aquatic system. In the spring, when there's an influx of nutrients, this initiates biological processes that can lead to the depletion of oxygen, which is my focus today is on starting at the source. So conservation practices can help minimize phosphorus runoff from the fields, but if we start at the source, we can get at those dissolved, um, those dissolved nutrients. And we'll save the conservation practice discussion for Dr. Penn. A great place to begin the discussion is going to be with for our nutrient stewardship, which is actively considering all management practices and site-specific characteristics when making the right nutrient management decisions. This is where nutrient management planning comes into play and why it's so critical that certified crop advisors, retailers, and other ag or conservation professionals discuss farm management as a system rather than only nutrient application. So just like Krista mentioned, it's really a full system that's, in, that's involved in nutrient management planning. The goal of 4R Nutrient Stewardship is to improve agricultural product production while contributing to social well-being and minimizing environmental impacts. To increase nutrient use efficiency and reduce the risk for losses, the fertilizer industry has led the 4R Nutrient Stewardship initi Initiative, which promotes using the right source of fertilizer at the right rate for crop needs, at the right time to match crop uptake, and the right place so crops can utilize it. This is what nutrient management planning is all about. How do we know what's the right rate if we don't understand what's already available in our soils for plants to uptake? Now keep in mind as I go through these slides for the four R's that each of them really it has to be considered with the other three. So when we look at the scientific principles for the right source, 
we want to supply nutrients in a plant available form. And that form has to suit the soil physical and chemical properties, recognizing those synergisms among nutrient elements and sources, and identify the benefits and sensitivities to associated elements. So making this decision without proper information for your specific field conditions can lead to a costly mistake. So it's really important to take time to understand the core scientific and economic principles that interact. The right rate will vary year to year as farm management affects our soil resources. The right phosphorus rate might be much higher than crop removal if soil test levels are low compared to when soil le test levels are near optimum. And likewise, changes in cropping system can result in a previous right rate for a specific crop needing to be modified. Some nutrients in excess can result in antagonistic relationships with another nutrient interfering with its uptake and availability and reducing use efficiency. If one essential element is low, it prevents plants from reaching their potential. <clears throat> and so appropriate fertilizer applications overcome these limitations. Soil testing every three to five years to ensure that nutrients are maintained at that sufficient level is really key. Additionally, there may be positive relationships as well. Uh, for example, if we look at phosphorus co concentrations that are increasing, the need for magnesium would also be increasing. And this relationship with phosphorus occurs when magnesium concentrations increase as well. When determining the right rate for fertilizer, it's important to consider all nutrient sources available to the plant. Animal manure is a common source of plant nutrients. And if you're already applying manure, that phosphorus really needs to be credited through the use of a manure test. That amount of phosphorus will vary based on the animal, how the manure is stored, and its moisture content. The amount of residual nutrients from a crop can also vary according to type, the type of crop and the environmental conditions. So this is really important to consider in a discussion with your client or your consultant. Nutrients should be applied to match the timing of plant uptake, which depends on the planting date, plant growth characteristics, sensitivities to deficiencies at particular growth stages, local weather and climate. Mineralization of soil organic matter may supply a large quantity of some nutrients, but if the crop's uptake needs do not coincide with mineralization, deficiencies may limit the production. In some areas, the potential for nutrient losses can be an important timing consideration, so avoid application before precipitation events or on frozen soil, or when soil melts is a potential. But nutrient application should also not delay operations that are sensitive such as, or time sensitive such as planting. Timing's becoming more challenging in certain regions of the United States because of those shorter growing seasons and the increasing amounts of precipitation. The core scientific principles that define the right place for specific nutrient application include consideration of where plant roots are growing. Nutrients need to be placed where they can be taken up by growing roots when needed. And different species of plants have different root growth patterns as shown in the, the figure on the bottom of the screen. And that's gonna affect their individual abilities to access nutrients in, in various locations within the soil. It's important to understand that soil chemical reactions that may lead to fixation. So concentrating nutrients that are not as mobile and bands can improve availability. Adjust the placement of your fertilizer based on tillage, the tillage system that's used. Subsurface placement techniques that maintain crop residue cover on the soil can help minimize surface disturbance, reduce runoff losses, and conserve soil moisture. And lastly, it's important to access differences within and among fields and crop productivity soil nutrient supply capacity and vulnerability to nutrient loss. And this is all going to be discussed uh, by Dr. McGrath later on in the presentation. So in order for phosphorus fertilizer to be most effective, it needs to be usable by the plant. And usability is increased by placement close to the seed row and protection from, uh, with protection from fixation losses. Now that we've gone through the four R's, I want to provide some background on why nutrient management should be planned using a systems approach. To do that, I want to take, make sure that we all understand the, 
that the critical value is the soil test level where recommended nutrient rates generally drop to zero in sufficiency approaches or to a crop removal level in build maintenance approaches. By using IPNI's soil testing database, which includes data from over 60 soil test labs, I was able to examine how soil test phosphorus levels have changed across the Mississippi River Basin. First, notice more soil tests are being submitted across the basin between 2001, when the program started, to 2015. This is really great progress. When looking at this data, keep in mind that the critical level can vary drastically within each state. 32% of the critical levels, um, or excuse me, 32% of the samples were below critical level, 23 at critical level, 18% was above 50 parts per million. And um, if, we, if you take a look at the range and what's shown in the gold on the screen, you can see that those, those samples collected at higher soil test levels has been decreasing uh, with, with time. And so that's, that's great to point out as well. 22 parts per million was the average for all of the data shown on the screen. And so um, based on that estimate, IPNI's soil test summary estimates that 47% of the soils are below the critical level. And that means that those fields would likely see a yield response from added phosphorus inputs. Another 52% of the soils tested at levels where either no phosphorus fertilizer is required or at most maybe a small amount of starter supplying less than the crop removal would be sufficient. The wide range of the soil test phosphorus levels really stresses the importance of soil sampling. And if, if everyone was following the recommendations, the proportion of soils in that optimum range would be much higher than the 1% that the survey was reporting. So we know why we want soil test phosphorus at the optimal level for farming, but why do we care about soil test phosphorus from an environmental standpoint? The loss of dissolved phosphorus from an in, in surface runoff is highly dependent on the phosphorus content of surface soil as illustrated on the graph, uh, which is a figure from a publication that Andrew Sharpley um, put out in 2001. And there's been a lot of research since then depicting similar uh, data. And this was from a watershed in South Central Pennsylvania. The soil test phosphorus is depicted on the bottom x-axis and the dissolved phosphorus concentration in surface runoff is on the, the y-axis. Generally, as soil test phosphorus increases, the concentration of the dissolved phosphorus in runoff increases. The data set also illustrates that there is a change point for the potential soil phosphorus release where more losses occur. Both are very high levels, so um, 220 for sandy loams and 175 for loams or clay loam soils. Um, and, and so keep that in mind as, as well. I do not have a data graphic depicted on the slide deck here, but um, there are many studies that show the similar relationship in subsurface flow also related to that surf, surface soil phosphorus. And this is why placement is important for minimizing phosphorus losses. As a quick example, this graph from a study out of Illinois shows that incorporating organic and inorganic fertilizers was an acceptable technique to reduce phosphorus losses from ag fields. Injecting swine manure and chisel plowing inorganic phosphorus fertilizer on the contour was not only effective in reducing phosphorus losses, but it also increased the time to runoff and decreased the, run the runoff volumes. Since the eastern half of the United States is experiencing increases in extreme precipitation events, placement and timing is becoming even more important. Phosphorus application method and timing relative to rainfall also influences the concentration of phosphorus and runoff and leachate. Several studies have shown a decrease in phosphorus loss from an increase in the length of time between phosphorus application and that time of precipitation. So unfortunately, this adds more uncertainty regarding the timing of applications. It is really getting difficult for farmers to do the right thing, especially in regions with shorter cropping seasons. As a way to build more resiliency, we have been hearing more on adoption of soil health practices. And as we do so, we must integrate 
adaptive phosphorus management, focusing on the four R's to optimize recovery and minimize those losses. I point this out because if we look at the soil factors that affect phosphorus availability highlighted in, on the screen in green, many are also impacted by soil health improvements. So I'll just give you a minute here to take a look down the, down the screen there. Therefore, we need to be considering how the integration of new management practices influence the rate, timing, and placement of phosphorus. Organic matter increases with, with soil health. Soil aggregation and porosity increases. Soil's buffering capacity increases. The water holding capacity increases. And the infiltration and hydrologic conductivity increases. So again, this is why we need to be looking at our landscape as a system and our management as a system. So if we make one change, we need to have that discussion on what does it mean for our fertilizer placement. With that, I leave you with two final thoughts. First, although we are not, I'll, so first, although there are not many conservation practices that specifically tackle dissolved phosphorus, implementation of site-specific FAR practices can reduce dissolved phosphorus losses and increase availability for crop utilization. Second, please encourage discussions on the agronomic benefits of for our nutrient stewardship. And with that, if there are any questions, I can take them if there's time now. Great, thanks so much, Heidi. Um, we just had two questions <laughs> and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get to those. Um, and we're a little uh, short on time, so if you could um, keep the answers a little bit brief, I'd appreciate it. Um, so the, the first question is, precision farming includes multiple sensors that measure soil uh, moisture, pH, and salinity, uh, meaning electrical conductivity. Uh, for the latter, could it possibly help manage right rate, right time, or time of N? Uh, but how can one use this data for right rate and time for P? Maybe this is a good question for Josh in this next yeah. presentation, but you can, well, that's what <laughs> it's a great segue question. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think let's hold off on that because okay. Josh is going to be spending that the time on his, on his presentation. Okay, we can great. We come back to it. Yeah. Great. And so just one other question. Um, I'll put it up here. <clears throat> can rock phosphate be considered as right pea fertilizer source despite of its high cadmium content that can accumulate in soil? So my, my, my answer to that is that, depend, again, it comes down to the fact that all fields are different and depending on where you're located, it can be the right source, um, certainly in certain regions of the, of the world, um, the rock phosphate can be considered a right uh, phosphorus fertilizer. And so, the, like I said, it, 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 I know that there are, um, audience members from all over the, the world. And so it's gonna really be dependent upon that location. What their context is, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Sure, great. Um, thanks so much, Heidi. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, it was very informative. And I'm gonna um, stop sharing Josh so you can take over the presentation here. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna read a bio. Um, so uh, Dr. Josh McGrath has served as an extension specialist and associate professor at the University of Kentucky from 2014 to now, and at the University of Maryland from 2006 to 2014. Dr. McGrath's integrated research and extension programs focus on developing, teaching, and implementing management practices that increase farm efficiency while protecting natural resources. So thanks, Josh, for, for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And um... Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm the Soil Fertility Extension Specialist at University of Kentucky. Uh, they asked me to talk about precision phosphorus management, but I'm going to really, unfortunately, be spending quite a bit of time on what we're doing wrong in precision ag. But I hope that I'll leave you with something that you can do. I, I'm also going to warn you that I am trying a slightly different method of doing online presentations. So uh, this is going to be a test case. Let's, let's all hope it works out well. Um, but with that, we'll jump into it. Heidi set us up with talking about the four R's, but it's important to recognize that the right is defined by the performance objective, and there are competing performance objectives. Maximizing yield, minimizing environmental impact, maximizing economic return. And so 
we really have to work to balance these trade-offs where maximizing yield is not maximizing profit and maximizing profit isn't the environmental optimum. In fact, the most profitable agronomic system will likely have some level of environmental impact. And so I, I want to make an argument that precision ag offers us the opportunity to balance these competing objectives and also target resources, not just for economic return, but to protect environmental resources by uh, protecting sensitive areas within a field. So uh, surveys report that 40 to 70% of the nutrients in North America are applied through some sort of variable rate strategy. And I, I'm not going to equate variable rate to precision ag, but oftentimes when we talk about precision nutrient management, we're talking about variable rate. And so, you know, what do we need to do this? Well, first of all, we need a map. We need to characterize the spatial variability in nutrient need. How do different areas of the field supply different amounts of nutrients and require different amount of nutrients? So it's both a soil and plant question. So we need a map. And usually this is based on some sort of soil sample strategy. And then we have to interpret that map or those soil test results with matching precision to how we're going to do the variable rate application. And we take that interpretation and we make a recommendation that's developed specifically for variable rate or precision ag. So it's got to be a highly precise recommendation, not just accurate. So how are we doing? Well, first off, we can vary fertilizer at a very fine resolution. Engineers have done a tremendous job of delivering uh, technology and tools that allow us to do variable rate, obviously. Um, you know, 40 to 70 percent of the nutrients are being applied through some sort of variable rate strategy. But we're not doing a very good job with the map. And I think people are surprised to hear this because grid sampling has been around, I mean, since the 90s. For decades, we've been mapping variable soil nutrient status in the field. But I'm going to make an argument here that, that probably not doing that as best as we could. And our recommendations were not developed to be precise. Rather, they were developed to be accurate. So on average, they're right. But in every spot, they're a little bit wrong. And this imprecision gets magnified when we go to a precision ag strategy. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that as well. Let's start talking about how we collect those soil samples. What are we doing? But what should we be doing when we go to the field to bring soils in for a precision ag strategy? So traditional soil sampling is meant to provide the central tendency or the average nutrient status of the field. We may even break the field up into 10 or 20 acre zones and do a little sampling that way, but generally we're looking for that mean nutrient need, whereas precision ag is breaking that field down into smaller management zones. And we go about this two prime ways. First, grid sampling, typically grid point, where we go out maybe on a two and a half acre grid, sample at the intersection of the grids, and we do some sort of interpolation to predict the value here at this unknown spot. This works well when management is what's causing that spatial variability. Our second strategy is zone management or directed sampling, where we use some layers like topography or soil texture, yield or imagery to break that field up into zones. And then we sample that zone intensively and we basically have one value for that zone. But it requires a lot of user input and high quality data. So it is labor and resource intensive and not typically used. So grid point sampling being the most common, again, we're using some sort of interpolation which the points where we did sample have the biggest impact on that unknown value that is predicted through interpolation. So this causes a problem because for interpolation to work, the samples must be collected close enough that they are correlated. And so we look at this correlation factor it has to be 0.3 for the interpolation to work. I really recommend you look up this paper by Lausanne et al. And 100 meter separation distance is the typical two and a half acre grid sample. And what they found was there was no correlation, and we didn't approach that 0.3 until we got down to 30 meters or a quarter acre grid. Now, clearly, we can't do quarter acre grid samples. That would be far too intensive. But people always say, well, isn't a two and a half acre grid better than just doing an average for the field? In fact, it's not. In fact, 95% of the time, it's not better. Because soils vary a lot in small distances, we tend to have these flyers that can really pull the interpolation away from the field average, which is oftentimes a better predictor of that unknown value. So interpolation with a coarse sample is worse than the field average because of this small scale variability. And so, you know, interpolation works and it's accurate, but it's only precise if we do it with very tight grid samples. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the soil lab methods that are involved, but I do want to bring out one little key part about soil analysis. And so, when we're doing uh, soil analysis, we're trying to provide some estimate of the nutrients that are going to be immediately available, so that intensity, and those that are stored and may become available over the course of the year. 
And so this is known as the buffer capacity, the relationship of quantity to intensity. But a lot of factors, both plant and soil factors, affect the quantity intensity relationship. So soil testing can only provide an index of that nutrient supply and capacity of the soil. It's not an absolute number that we can kind of hang our hat on. And so on average, it does a good job. Again, not really precise. Then we take that soil test data and we have to interpret it and make a recommendation. And so now we take this kind of average soil test that is meant to estimate or index the availability and we do something like correlation. So with correlation, we have the soil test, uh, relative yield. Each one of these points represents the ratio of unfertilized to fertilized yield. And we're looking for that point above which we don't need fertilizer and below which we do on the soil test scale. And then we take that and we do some calibration. And so we go to fields with multiple different soil test levels and we say, how much fertilizer? We apply different rates now on the horizontal axis. How much fertilizer do I need to maximize yield? And it's important to point out that I need more fertilizer at low testing soils, but I can still reach that max yield. There's a lot of variability in the correlation and calibration data. And we use statistical methods that just kind of average that response. But for precision ag, maybe we should be looking at that ver ver variability or the spread of that data. And so then we take and we move from that to a more philosophical part of de determining how we're going to approach making the recommendation. As Heidi said, sufficiency is just applying exactly what we need to meet crop needs. We don't really know what that is. We haven't done a good job of capturing what that sufficiency rate is. Build and maintain means I'm going to try and rapidly build to the optimum level in the soil test. And then even after I hit optimum, I'm still going to at least apply crop removal. In reality, <clears throat> no one uses one of these as a standalone method, but instead we all use some sort of hybrid approach where we apply some rapid build at very low soil tests, maybe some maintenance at, at higher soil tests beyond the critical level. And you know, we need to do a better job of going back and getting this data that goes into that sufficiency recommendation. There's a group in North America, FIRST, F-R-S-T, that's working on this. I recommend you taking a look at them on Google because we're going to have to move to a basis in precision ag where we use that sufficiency rate, which is less than the build and maintain rate, and probably even less than the crop removal or maintenance rate, um, <clears throat> you know, because the soil makes up a big part of what's supplied to the plant. And so the fertilizer only needs to make up the difference because of that buffering capacity and that storage in the soil. So we want to move back to the sufficiency approach, but being able to accurately or precisely predict that is going to be difficult because the soil is kind of like this iceberg. And soil testing just measures that tip of the iceberg, but there's this big part below that the Malik 3 or the Olsen or the Bray doesn't pick up, and that varies as we move across the field. So, you know, we've got to ask ourselves, how do we move forward? What are we going to do if we're going to improve precision and do a better job, you know, with precision nutrient management going forward? So, historically, we've done, you know, pretty traditional soil fertility trials, 5P rates, randomized in blocks at multiple locations over multiple years. And I see proposals from researchers all the time that say we need more soil testing data. But I would argue we don't need more data. We need different data. And so we've started working on trying to develop some new research designs and analysis methods where we try and look at that small scale variability in response to the crop nutrients. So we've minimized the plot spot, uh, plot size. And so we set up a plot that's 40 foot by 40 foot, and we have fertilized and unfertilized replicated twice within that area. Then we take that plot and randomly assign it throughout a large field. And that fertilized, for us, we used a two by two application with 60 pounds of P2O5, and we look at the relative response. So let's look at the plant size at V4 to V6. Here's the University of Kentucky critical level at 30 ppm, and we see that most of the time, we get a lot bigger plant when we use fertilizer because it falls below that 95% relative biomass, right? We can double the plant size many times by applying fertilizer when your soil test is single digit. That makes sense. So on average, our soil test recommendations were right. Those plants need phosphorus when the soil test is 5 ppm male at 3 or 10 ppm male at 3. And when we look at yield, on average for those fields, three out of four site years, we had a statistically significant yield response of nine to 18 bushels per acre. So on average, when soil test is low, below our critical level, we see that we get more yield, right? So on average, it works. But when you look at the precision, it failed 50% of the time. We take those plots over 2016, 2018, two years, and when we're below that critical level, half the time we got a yield response and half the time we did not get a yield response. So we have to figure out what is it about our correlation and calibration? What's varying in addition to just soil tests 
and causing this variability in response. Because if we're going to do precision ag, we have to be able to look at the small scale in the field and identify what areas need phosphorus and what areas don't. We don't really have an answer, I'm sad to say, yet. Yeah, we've been working at this for a while. But I can tell you that a lot of these areas that have the low soil tests that don't respond to phosphorus are because they're very high yielding areas of the field. So maybe it's something about quote unquote soil health because there's a higher yield potential, plant has better roots and I don't need to add the fertilizer. So what can you do now? Well, we know grid sampling is not gonna work when we interpolate it, but maybe we can use that grid data. Or maybe we take that money, and instead of sampling every three or four years, we sample every year and do fewer samples. We know that zones are probably a better idea, but there's not much guidance out there on how to make good zones, and it's really labor intensive. We could take our grid data and not interpolate it, but overlay it on the zones in the field and look at the mean and the standard deviation. That might help us learn a little bit more about how to vary rate. We are working here in Kentucky to design some online video tutorials to use freely available software from the ARS to uh, really walk you through making zones. And we're hoping to have those videos out by the end of the year. But at the end of the day, it is very labor intensive. And so I will say our recommendations are good. They're very accurate for average ag. They fall apart under precision strategies to some extent. So start with your regular recommendations, set up your zones, and you're gonna have to do some on-farm trials and set up strip trials to evaluate those recommendations in the context of precision. But there are three other R's we need to talk about. It's not just rate that matters. So, you know, traditionally we're trying to find this critical level with soil tests. We have these interpretive categories of low, medium, and optimum that give us some sort of rate recommendation. But I think we need to move past this tr traditional kind of view of soil testing and just trying to get a rate recommendation. And instead we need to bring in other tests that assess the, both the economics of our fertilizer decisions, the environmental impact of our fertilizer decisions. And so now we're looking at a low, medium, and high probability of environmental impact. And we combine those together into a comprehensive management tool that should output not just rate, but source, placement in three dimensions, timing and conservation practices like Chad's gonna talk about, some of the structural conservation practices we can put in place. And so I think it's really important to get to this place where we have a more advanced tool that is transparent and quantitative and addresses what our overall need as far as managing uh, these resources. So with that, that's all. It was uh, a million miles a minute, I know, um, but I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Matt. And uh, if you have any questions, maybe we have some time to get into those. Great, thanks so much, uh, Josh. And, um... Uh, I think we did have a couple questions. <clears throat> Sorry, we did have a couple questions come in along the way. Um, one one question was the one that we had already had. So sure. um, I think both these questions are really data driven, and you know you're making the case here that we don't need so much more data. We need better data. So maybe this fits right in with that. So the first one was precision farming. Are you looking at my screen right now? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can okay. see it. Yep. Great. So pre precision farming includes multiple sensors. Um, and so they asked specifically about the salinity sensor and could it help sure. manage uh, right time and rate of end. So, so I saw that come up in the chat from Ed and uh, we've included Varus, so apparent electrical conductivity and Dulum in some of our research with that small scale phosphorus study. Uh, you know, it really gives you a, a, a more precise soil texture map because by picking up salinity or electrical conductivity, it's looking at the, the water films on the clay. So the more clay you have, the higher that EC number. And so it gives us a little bit more precise soil texture map. And we're finding that for developing zones, soil texture combined with landscape position, so slope and aspect, looks like it may have some uh, potential, but I can't confirm that right now. You know, so we're using a method that has, uses fuzzy cluster analysis to drill down through these layers, top topography <coughs> and soil texture, and then using uh, high density soil sampling within those zones to see if that helps us better predict these areas that have low soil test P but don't need fertilizer or conversely areas with high soil test P but do need fertilizer. But I can't say that we have a tool yet that is usable. It's still very uh, young in the research stage. Still to come, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so one other question here, uh, which is we see in precision ag uh, that using drones and remote sensing allows uh, end management. Uh, what about pea fertilization? Yeah, so I do a lot of talking about variable rate nitrogen using sensors like Green Seeker or Optrix or these active optical sensors. 
drones kind of do the same thing. We're using an index like NDVI and you put it into some sort of algorithm that in real time you can vary your nitrogen rate, your response to crop need. With phosphorus, uh, phosphorus is so totally different than nitrogen that uh, the response seems it, it's, it's more tied to that plant's ability to access the phosphorus that's in the soil. So you saw in that one figure where we had soil tests of 5 ppm, but we could have a plot that's on 5 ppm malic 3 and it's the highest yield potential in the field and I don't need any fertilizer. And then I have another plot that's 5 ppm and it's at the kind of field average yield and I do need phosphorus fertilizer. And so the trick would be, can we use some sort of remote sensing to uh, distinguish those areas and set up zones and then go back in and soil test to generate a rate recommendation. So I think it's gonna be a combination tool. It won't just be a reactive algorithm, but it will also have some prescriptive part where we're soil sampling. And I would also say that one of the things we're looking at is, can we lay a cover crop down on this field, let's say ahead a of a, a, a corn crop in the rotation and have some reference phosphorus strips in there and sense that field when the cover crops out in the spring, let's say in March, and then use that map of the cover crop to develop a phosphorus map for the following corn crop based on that cover crop's response to that phosphorus strip. So that's one idea we're, we're playing with. That's interesting. Great. Um, thanks so much again, Josh, for doing the presentation. And I'm going to switch over here. I'm going to stop sharing and let uh, Chad Penn share. Um, I want to make sure you can sh share Chad after um, Josh's problems there. Are you able to? Yeah, it looks like you are. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and read your bio here, and then you can get started. Uh, so Dr. Chad Penn is a soil scientist with the USDA ARS in West Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, his focus is on the soil chemistry of phosphorus as it informs fertility recommendations and phosphorus transport. And he has considerable experience in the areas of manure chemistry man and management, um, nutrient transport, and phosphorus removal. And uh, he's got to talk to us a lot about what happens after the peas applied, aren't you, Chad? All right, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be able to uh, speak to to all of you. So uh, we started out with Krista on the on the front end of it, talking about the the production of fertilizer, uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Peterson, Dr. McGrath, talking about um, how much to apply, when, where for our all that. So now you're at the tail end of the dog here. Uh, now, after it's on the ground, after it's out there, um, what do we do to, to, to also help keep it in place using various field conservation practices? <clears throat> so first thing, we're gonna establish just a, a few simple principles to uh, premise the rest of the discussion before we talk about the actual practices, but nutrients are transported with water, okay? No, no surprise there, but specifically, Nutrients are transported in both the dissolved and the particulate form. And particulate form, I mean uh, nutrients that are bound onto sediment. Uh, and then as that, that sediment gets transported, uh, it takes nutrient with it. We call that particulate bound phosphorus. And we have dissolved forms of nutrients that are transported as well. Uh, particularly for nitrogen, it's mostly nitrate and ammonium. And of course we have uh, phosphate or some uh, form of phosphate transported in the dissolved phase. So um, another uh, thing to keep in your back pocket is that dissolved phosphorus is a more potent eutrophication agent than particulate phosphorus. Um, Dr. Peterson mentioned uh, about eutrophication, the problems with that. And the thing about uh, dissolved pea is that aquatic organisms can immediately uptake dissolved phosphorus from water as soon as it hits the water body. That's not true for particulate pea. For particulate pea, the phosphorus bound on that sediment may or may not desorb. It just depends on the conditions, of the water body, the sediment, the mineralogy of that sediment. Um, it may adsorb phos dissolved phosphorus from the water column. It, it, just, it just depends, but dissolved P is, is more potent. Okay, so before we go any further, it's good to uh, establish, discuss a little bit about the nuts and bolts of what phosphorus actually is. So for this, I, I like to reach back you know, as, as a scientist, we have to remember that, you know, science does fall under the umbrella of philosophy. So we go back to Aristotle and the four causes. Most people only, they think of just cause and effect, but truly there's four causes. Um, again, taught by Aristotle, then this, uh, forgotten for a thousand years, rediscovered by uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas. So we have uh, material cause, structural cause, and we have efficient cause, which is your normal cause and effect. 
that most people think of, and then we have final cause. All right? most, many scientists, they generally, a lot of times they take a very limited view and, and they, they only consider efficient cause, cause and effect, with the exception of biologists. Um, and our statistics are very much focused on this cause and effect, but you know, it, it, it really helps to understand the nature of what an object is from those, those four causes. So we're gonna contrast nitrogen and phosphorus, consider the essence of nitrogen and phosphorus. Based on the structure of what it is, it, it, it can behave a certain way. You know, for example, I can take a, uh, no matter how hard I try, I cannot take a rooster and make it lay eggs, okay? It's just, it, it, it's, it's part of the, the uh, nature of what it is. So th thus it is with nitrogen and phosphorus. Now they look similarly, um, you know, they both have five, they, they both exist as oxyanions, nitrate, phosphate. They both have five outer shell electrons, but the way those electrons are distributed and everything else, they, uh, long story short, they have very different electronegativity. And that has a major impact on, on how they behave and how they bind uh, with other things in the environment, particularly with oxygen and beyond. And so ultimately what that translates to is that for nitrogen, it doesn't stick to the soil for the most part. All right, so if nitrogen is not being taken up by the plant, you're gonna lose it. You're gonna lose it through either leaching or you're gonna lose it uh, as a gas, some sort of a gas. Phosphorus, on the other hand, uh, because of its nature, it is ex has a strong affinity uh, for, for most many soil minerals, right? And what we observe is that much of the phosphorus that's added to the soil um, is not able to come off. Uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, Maumee watershed, we find that uh, only 5% of phosphorus that's added is, is lost in, in, in drainage water. So totally different from nitrogen. It's, it's extremely sticky and a lot, and Kristen uh, will tell you that one of the big problems with phosphorus is that it sticks too tight and we have problems uh, with fertility because of that. So, all right, next, uh, before we get into these practices, let's talk about the basics of contaminant, fate, and transport. These are the very basics. Two, two things to keep in your back pocket. Load reduction of nutrients and stabilizing the soil to reduce sediment transport. If you can, do, you can do those two things, you can control it. So first, nutrient loads and concentration. So what is a nutrient load? The load is the mass of the nutrient that's being lost, okay? That's what we really care about. Concentration times your flow volume equals your load. So concentration is one component of the pollutant load, but it's not the only component. The most important thing being delivered to the water body is the, is the actual mass. How many pounds of phosphorus is entering that water body? And for that reason, the EPA utilizes uh, TMDLs or total maximum daily loads as a regulatory tool. Now BMPs, we're gonna talk about here, they may target either concentration or the flow volume in an attempt to reduce the load. Okay, what about sediment loss and erosion? Well, that comes back to particulate phosphorus. So we have sediment that's transported. Um, we have uh, intense rainfall events that detach particles from the soil. Phosphorus is bound tightly to those particles. We go back again to the nature of phosphorus. It's bound to it very strongly. And with high energy, uh, that sediment can be transported and uh, deposited into a water body. Now, one thing we've known over countless decades of research is that our risk of soil erosion decreases dramatically as we stabilize the soil and cover it and protect it. So bottom line is if you stop erosion, you prevent transport of most of the phosphorus. And that's because in many systems, most of the phosphorus transport occurs through particulate phosphorus. So there's three ways to prevent broad ways here to prevent sediment particulate phosphorus loss in surface waters. So, you know, obviously stabilizing the soil with cover and rooting. Um, also filtration of sediment as it leaves the field through the grass buffers or settling ponds, uh, uh, wetlands. Uh, also reduction of drop and runoff kinetic energy through, again, adding cover, increasing cover, breaking up steep flow pathways, adding riprap. But if your soils are high in phosphorus, they get into the uh, beyond what's needed by plants and, and far beyond that, we have what's called legacy pea soils. In that case, erosion control will not decrease the losses of dissolved pea. They'll be built up so high, you'll continue to lose it. This is uh, 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 some, uh, similar to uh, uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Peterson was talking about earlier. 
Uh, this is from data from University of Maryland from uh, experiments that Josh and Frank Cole started where they artificially increased soil test P levels up very high, nearly 600 milligrams per kilogram malic like three. They cut off all P applications and started to draw down that P level in the soil. And what they found is that it takes decades to draw the soil levels back down to a safe level. Uh, what they concluded was that if you have malic 3 levels from 300 to 400 milligrams per kilogram, it's going to take 20 to 30 years to drop it down to a safe level where it's not constantly leaking out dissolved phosphorus every time you have an event. This is a similar figure to what uh, Dr. Pearson showed where, you know, you increase your soil test P levels. Even when you control the erosion, your dissolved P losses will proportionally increase, and that can be the runoff or subsurface drainage. So every time you get a flow event, for decades, the P is high, you're going to lose a little bit of dissolved P. And remember, it's more potent eutrophication agent. So establishing that, let's talk about some of these BMPs that we can use to uh, get after it. Vegetated buffer strips. These are simply uh, grass, grass strips, typically, on the edges of, of uh, creeks, ditches, streams that filter sediment before reaching the surface water. And these work by reducing particulate phosphorus. So it's, it's, it's reducing erosion. They may also promote the infiltration of water into soil, which um, that's, that's decreasing your uh, flow volume. Uh, so it can decrease uh, dissolved P losses through that volume reduction for low intensity events, not so much for high intensity events, but it's also temporary. Uh, many times these soils can become a dissolved P source. Grass waterways are similar to the buffer strips, except you're establishing a permanent grass uh, over a naturally occurring flow path within the field, as you can see on the right here. Uh, water's leaving this field, eroding a lot of soil with it, so make it a permanent grass waterway. This reduces erosion, therefore it reduces particulate phosphorus losses, and allows water to be transported off the field while reducing the kinetic energy. Reduced tillage, no tillage, conservation tillage. The goal is to leave residue on the surface to reduce erosion. You see in the left versus the right. So as you expect, this reduces particulate P losses. And it may also achieve volume reduction, uh, reduce the load that way through increasing infiltration. But it, it does allow the applied phosphorus, the manure or fertilizer, to remain concentrated near the, the surface. And so we get stratification. Uh, near the surface and that can increase dissolved P losses. An example of that here, we have dissolved P losses uh, in runoff from a uh, high P no-till soil versus a high P tilled soil. You can see with the tilled soil, we actually reduced our dissolved P losses, but when we look at particulate P losses, it's flip-flop. Here's our no-till soil with particulate P losses. You don't lose much sediment, so you don't lose much particulate P, but your flip-flop, now your plowed soil uh, has much higher particulate losses. And you can see, compared to that figure on the bottom, it mirrors sediment losses. So you kind of trade uh, particulate for dissolved P losses with, uh, when you go, you change tillage operations. Cover crops. Cover crops are live cover established between growing season. And for nitrogen, these, they, they often, they're often used to catch the remaining nitrogen in the soil, take it out of the ground before it can leach out. And it also provides a cover to reduce erosion. So it can reduce particulate P losses as a result. But we don't see any reductions in dissolved P. And if you go back and again, consider the nature of phosphorus, its essence, what it is, how it behaves, it, it, it shouldn't reduce dissolved P because unlike nitrogen, very little of your total soil phosphorus is in solution. Going back to what Dr. McGrath talked about, that buffering ability of soils. They don't keep much phosphorus in solution. Um, it buffers it uh, uh, well, but it doesn't keep it at high concentrations. Nitrogen, on the, on the other hand, is not buffered by the soil at all. That's why cover crops work for nitrogen, not for dissolved phosphorus. So unlike phosphorus, the majority of, ni of nitrogen in, left in the soil can be taken up before a major drainage event. That's not true for phosphorus. So actually, uh, literature shows that cover crops can increase dissolved P losses through the leaching of crop residue. Uh, there's various studies that have showed generally the consensus is that uh, you get either, uh, a, well, you get a reduction in particulate phosphorus losses and then either no change or an increase in dissolved phosphorus losses. Drainage water management. So this is simply, um, uh, it, it's like putting a dam on your subsurface tile drains and on your uh, 
ditches, uh, culvert pipes and ditches and it backs the water up in a field, raises the water table. And so this directly goes after reducing the load by reducing the volume. So it reduces the amount of water that leaves the field, uh, thereby reducing loads. Um, raises the water table, again, prevents water from leaving the field. And, but it also promotes anaerobic conditions. And this is good for nitrogen because it promotes denitrification, reduces nitrate losses, but it may cause iron-bound phosphorus to dissolve under those same anaerobic conditions. And sometimes we observe increased dissolved phosphorus concentrations. So you get, consider that load equation. Now there, it, it's, 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 it's kind of fighting itself. You've got decreases in flow volume, but you've got increases in dissolved P concentration. And so what we find is that the load reduction for dissolved P is highly variable with drainage water management. It can, go, it can be negative, positive, neutral. Blind inlets. Right, blind inlets are uh, small uh, uh, gravel drainage layers placed into the depressions of fields. Uh, it allows water to drain through the field into a, a gravel layer and filter out the sediment um, before it's taken away to a ditch of some sort or back into the tile drain system. And <clears throat> generally these work very good for reducing particulate P losses. Usually they are used to replace a tile riser in a field. You see that orange thing, Hickenbottom here sticking out in the bottom. Uh, normally you imagine sediment rich water flowing through that uh, pipe. So all that sediment is short circuited directly to a ditch into the tile drain system. Replace that with this blind inlet, this, this, this bed of gravel and a drainage system, and it will filter out the sediment. They usually use limestone or whatever local gravel is available. Um, so it reduces particulate P. Um, very, we've had the longest running blind inlet, uh, 12 years running, and it removed about 40% of the particulate P over 12 years, but it does little to nothing for dissolved P because the material does not have any affinity for dissolved P. Now, if you replace that gravel material with a filter material that will bind up phosphorus, it will reduce dissolved P. And that brings me to my last BMP of P removal structures, which is nothing but a giant landscape scale uh, filter uh, containing media that has a high affinity for dissolved phosphorus placed in a waterway or uh, for treating subsurface drainage um, where that media becomes saturated with phosphorus with time uh, and it's able to be replaced and cleaned out with, with new media uh, eventually. So again, it's, it's, it's nothing uh, complicated. It's just a giant Brita filter for phosphorus. It's a little bit more involved. Designing one to meet certain goals and flow rates, they have to be able to handle a high flow rate. Uh, but uh, basically, it's, it's just a giant filter. And so, you know, with that in mind, you can build these structures. They look a lot of different ways. Uh, Josh and I built a bunch of these on uh, Eastern Shore of Maryland and ditches. I built uh, several throughout the United States and designed more uh, in the United States and Canada. They can look a lot of different ways, but again, they're all, they're all filters and the heart of it is the phosphorus absorption media. We developed this P-trap software that people can use. It's basically a, a, a engineering for, for lay, lay conservationists so they can, they can actually design a structure to meet certain removal goals that's site specific and specific to their filter media. So I uh, recommend you check that out. All right, to summarize, um, you know, basically there's a lot of structural BMPs, field BMPs that are effective at particulate phosphorus reduction. Um, we're pretty good at that, but there's very few, basically with the exception of phosphorus removal structures, you know, these field BMPs are generally ineffective at reducing dissolved phosphorus losses, and that's a problem because dissolved P losses are a uh, uh, more potent eutrophication agent. So if you go back to what, what Heidi, uh, and Josh are talking about really, you know, the most efficient and cost-effective method to prevent dissolved P losses is through proper nutrient management, four R's, uh, all of that, and prevent the problem from occurring in the first place. If you prevent the formation of legacy P soils, then you'd never even have to deal with a phosphorus removal structure. And it's a lot cheaper to do good nutrient management, prevent the problem, than have to solve it once it's already uh, in the field. All right, with that. Um, so we have any, thank you all for your time, uh, Ray, for any questions.
That was fantastic, Chad, and I really appreciated the Aristotelian framing of your presentation. <laughs> As a bit of a philosophy nerd myself, so uh, we just had one question come in, uh, and that is: um, Is there any uptake of dissolved phosphorus by the roots of uh, grassy waterway BMPs? Oh, sure. I mean, there'll there'll be some, but it's it's going to be very minimal. It uh, it's not as if the grass waterway can. Um, absorb the, 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 the phosphorus as, as water is moving through it at, you know, 500 gallons per minute or, or whatever it is. It's not, uh, phosphorus uptake is, is, is not that fast. It's, it's, it's very, very slow. So um, it, will, it will take up the phosphorus in the soil immediately around the root zone, and that's about it. It's mostly just going to handle your, reduce your particulate losses by reducing erosion. Got it. Well, thanks again, and thanks to all four of the panelists. Those were great presentations, and I appreciate the time you put into uh, putting them together and really appreciate the uh, audience coming here with great questions as well. I just want to leave you with one final note before we close, and that's to remind you again to please come to our Phosphorus Forum if you enjoyed these talks. Uh, there's plenty more coming on September 30th and October 1st and some opportunities to network at, the, at that event as well. Of course, it'll have to be virtual, but uh, we'll make it happen. So please uh, come check us out. You can go to our website at phosphorusalliance.org and um, look at under the activities tab at that page to get to the registration page for the forum. Um, and with that, I'll close out. Thanks again, everyone, for attending the Sustainable Phosphorus webinar series. We'll look forward to seeing you at the next one. Bye now. <laughs>